Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Lord, we just we thank you for each person here. We thank you for each person who listens to this message. And we just pray, Lord, that you would have your way with us. Open our eyes to see and our ears to hear what the Spirit would say, Lord. And we pray that just like that breeze blowing off the ocean right now uh, to refresh us, we pray that your Holy Spirit would refresh us and give us this day what would encourage our faith and draw us ever closer to you. We ask that now in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, guys, this is a blessed morning. I get the privilege to dedicate Patricia to the Lord. Patrick and Felicia over here have their beautiful baby with us. And uh, before I do the dedication, uh, uh, years ago I taught why do we dedicate babies instead of baptize them? And uh, what, what, where does that come from in the scripture? And it wound up being one of the radio uh, things that they put together, the guys, and they spent a lot of time editing, pu- getting all my stuttering out and everything. But they make me sound really good. If you watch the YouTubes, I stutter. If, if you listen to me on the radio, I don't, because that's because of our dear, <laughs> dear RT working on me and uh, fixing me up. But but this morning, uh, um, the requests have been made, you know, would you make a, a YouTube about it? So I'm going to do something different. I'm going to teach just a small portion of First John after the dedication, but I'm going to take a little bit of time to explain from the scripture, why do we dedicate a baby? And, uh, and, and the, the main reason is really simple. Okay, you want to know my main reason? It's because I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Christ. And was Jesus baptized as a baby or was he dedicated? He was dedicated. And there's a reason he was dedicated, which that's the part I'm going to share with you this morning. And it's found in Luke chapter 2. I'll read it to you. Now, Luke's gospel is the only gospel that tells us about the early days of Jesus as a, as a child. You know, John's gospel just starts off with, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. You know, the word became flesh, dwelt among us. They skips the whole baby thing and just jumps into Jesus at, you know, his grown, mature appearance to the world as a, uh, you know, uh, appearing to, to present the gospel. But Luke backs up to the days even before Jesus is born to his cousin who will be born. Uh, you guys know who his cousin is, right? It's very special, John the Baptist. And um, John the Baptist, if you remember the story found in, in Luke chapter 1, that um, his, his father was chosen by he was of the of the tribe of levi he was one of the guys chosen to go in to do the offering before the lord and when he went in um he didn't come out right away remember this zacchaeus he 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 went in there or zacharias he went in and he tarried a while and they're like what's going on you know hope he didn't die in there because sometimes you know a high priest would go in to make an offering and they used to tie a rope by the way and bells around his hem of his garment if they didn't hear anything they would just you know if the guy brought in an offering and he was not right before god they the lord would smite him i i tell you i don't want to be the high priest <laughs> not not the job but but this guy had the priestly duties of going and putting the table of show bread lighting the the candles that are the that are filled with the oil there and he went in to do his duties and and does anyone remember in Luke 1 w- w- who he met inside of the temple? He met an angel. And the angel told him, you are going to have a, a child with your wife. And, and um, he's like, uh, excuse me, but I'm old. And um, she's old. And we've tried for a long time. And it really hasn't worked. And, you know, how can this be? And the angel told him, listen, I'm the angel. Do you guys remember his name? Gabriel, Gabriel, Gab in Hebrew, Gabriel. Gab is to, well, we use it in English, gabbing, to speak. I'm the one who speaks. E-L is for, would be E is for, and L is a contraction for Elohim. I'm the one who speaks for God. In other words, I bring God's message. I'm God's messenger. I'm bringing you God's message. You're going to have a baby with your wife, Elizabeth. And he's like, I don't know how this is going to be. He says, all right, you don't believe me? you're not going to be able to speak until it comes to pass. Do you guys remember this? I love how Luke's gospel starts off. The old guy gets smit with, you know, zip lip. 
You know, the Lord just like zipped his lip and threw away the key. And he comes out and he's signing, you know, and they're like, he must have seen something. He can't talk. What, why aren't you talking to him? <laughs> you know, how do you say, I saw an angel. He said we'd have a baby. And, you know, sign that out and you never had sign language. Can you imagine the quagmire he went through trying to explain, you know, and they're like, something happened to him. Well, if you know the story, this is how the Gospel of Luke opens is the introduction of the forerunner to the Messiah. And it will come about that Elizabeth must like this strong, silent type because she does wind up pregnant and she has the baby. And when it came time, now in Jewish culture, when you have a baby boy, the first week is the week for the women just to rest. Um, there's a seven-day period. Uh, it's um, the time of what they call in the Levitical law of uncleanness. She's supposed to just... Like the same as in administration time, she's supposed to just rest and and sh not to present herself in public, just gets to, she gets a break. You know, and we should do this in our culture, by the way. <laughs> but but in the law, God had a lot more s smarts than our culture sometimes. So so she gets the first seven days off. On the eighth day, the, the child is named. You don't have to have the pressure to get the name right. You got a whole week to get ready. On the eighth day is the day you name the boy, and you circumcise him on the eighth day. Now, interestingly enough, our scientists have just caught up to God, and they discovered in just recent decades that uh, a child's immune system is the strongest of its entire life on which day of its life? Do you know? The eighth day. Really interesting fact that God just, coincidental, right? Of course, just, just happened to be. So circumcise the boy on the eighth day and give him his name. Well, they went to do that to the child. Here he is. He, he, they're bringing John the Baptist, but they, they're going to name him Zacharias after dad. So they go to name him, and, and in Luke chapter 1, um, they, they tell him, we're going to name him after you, and he calls for a tablet, it says, and, and says, mm -mm -mm, gets a tablet and writes, his name is what? John. And as soon as he wrote the word John and they said it, it says his mouth was opened. And then he speaks this beautiful praise to God about how God has, has revealed to him. Now, for, he's had this bottled up for a while. I mean, we know at least nine months, but, you know, no guarantee they got pregnant right immediately. Could have been 10, a year. Can you imagine a year you have known something that an angel told you and you were like, I don't know if it's true. I'm an old guy and... That the Lord gives you a whole, you know, nine month to a year to stew it over, <laughs> to think about what you. And so then he, 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 he proclaims, this boy, this is the boy who's going to be, you know, the forerunner, like the, like the, like the prophet wrote, that is going to come be before the Messiah and, and prepare the way of the Lord. He's going to cry out, you know, make clear the path of the Lord, make, get ready for his coming. And, and so this is. This is John, his, his eighth day naming. And then, um, and then we turn the page and we get to Luke chapter 2 and we find out about Jesus being born. And, and, and let me just show you here. It says, and on the eighth day, this is verse 21 of Luke, tw Luke chapter 2, verse 21. When, when eight days had passed, before his circumcision, it says, his name was then called, what? Jesus. The name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. You remember the angel appeared to Joseph and told him, this is Mary's with child, but not, don't worry. She, he was concerned. And he said, it, the child within her is, is, is from the Holy Spirit over, overshadowing her. And so that child, he said, it, he's going to be the one to save men from their sins. Told Joseph the whole plan of salvation. You'd have to, I believe. To let him know that, you know, hey, because, you know, if you know we didn't fool around and she's with child, and what would, what would a natural man think? She, she must have been with someone else. And, and, and the only one she was with was, was the Spirit of God. And here, they give the name what the angel had revealed to Joseph and to Mary. Mary was also told this. And they name him Jesus or Yahshua in the Hebrew. We say Joshua, by the way, in English, but... It's really Yahshua. There's no J in Hebrew. It's a Yad. Ya, y it's a, a kind of a Y-ish sound in our language. So it's Yahshua, and it's Yahshua. It's a contraction. It's for 
Yehovah Shua. Yehovah is the n like the title of, like we would say, the Lord, the master of the universe. The, the Lord, that's God's title. And Shua in Hebrew is really easy. You guys know what Shua is? If you've heard me teach this before, it's the Lord's salvation. So, you know, you go up to Jesus, who are you? Um, God's salvation. No, come on, really. What, what's your name? The Lord's salvation. Yehovah Shua. Or they contract it to Yahshua. Yahshua. And so we say in English, Jesus. Okay, but that comes over to us from first to the, to the Greek, to Jesus, to Latin, and, and then finally to English, Jesus. So we get his name given here. The eighth day. Now, I don't know if you knew that about Jewish culture, but you don't name the baby till the eighth day. The day that you circumcise them. And here we read on, it says, And when the days of the purification according to the law of Moses were completed, then they brought Jesus up to Jerusalem to present him to who? To the Lord. This is what we call a presentation of a baby to the Lord or dedication to the Lord. And this is part of their law, according to the law. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but, but this whole law thing, you know, by the way, for girls, if you had a girl... It's a little different. The woman's time of uncleanness instead of a week, she gets two weeks. Okay? And it's not till the 15th day what you would name. And, oh, I forgot. It says here, just so you know the culture, it says, when the days for the purification according to of Moses were completed, when they finished the, the days, um, it's the first week is for the rest, then the naming, and then, get this, they get 33, if they have a boy, they get 33 more days to, to rest. This is found, by the way, if you're, from, if you're not familiar with this, I'd like to point it out just so that the people in the audience would know where I, where I find these things. But in the, in the book of Leviticus, chapter 12, this is the law of, of motherhood. And I'm going to give it to you so you know what happens for the guy and if you have a, if you have a baby girl. It's different. Look at this. It, it, if you want to look on Levit Leviticus chapter 12, it says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, and say, When a woman gives birth to and bears a male child, he shall, she shall be unclean for seven days, as in the days of her menstruation, she shall be unclean. On the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. And then it says, She shall remain in the blood of her purification for 33 days and she shall not touch any consecrated thing nor enter the sanctuary until the days of her pur purification are completed she gets 33 by the way we really need to pay attention here she gets 33 more days of rest this is don't go out don't have to present your, you know it's unfair what they do in american culture to the women they, they you know they just had a baby give them a break you know but God knew. He gives them 33. He gives them first week, then name the baby, and then you get a month off. A month and a couple days. Now, gals, is this a good idea? Does the Lord know what he's doing? Look, look at what happens if you get a girl. Verse 5 says, But if she bears a female child, then she shall be unclean for two weeks. And then, as in her menstruation, then she shall remain in, in the blood of her purification for 66 days. Well, let's just double it. You know, two from one week to two, from 33 days to 66 days. She gets to take a break. Now, I know our society puts a lot of pressure on the gals. They have a baby and they're like, let's present them to the world. Like, um, our, well, in my wife's case, we had, we had people from church show up at the hospital like minutes after our, our, our baby was born and we're like, she's... <laughs> She's, they're going, oh, you look so good, Jan. And she's thinking, I don't want you in the room. You know, she wouldn't say that. I, I'll, you know, this is not the appropriate time for you to come visit the baby, you know. And, and God knew this stuff. Our culture is the only crazy culture that does Snapchat and, you know, got to post a video and, and, and put it on Facebook, just had a baby, you know. And, you know, the baby's all wrinkly and everything. And for those of you who haven't been at a birth, you, you know, they don't always come out looking perfect. And, and, uh, and, and, you know, the Lord already accommodated that. He's like, look, first week, stay home. Have a girl, two weeks, stay home. 
then they would do the 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 naming. I know I didn't read it here, but this is found. The 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 part of the naming comes in from the other part of Leviticus. It's more law, but it's in there. And and then you name them, and then take thirty three days off for a boy and sixty six off for a girl. Just relax. Time for recovery. Now is the Lord smart? He knew what he was doing. So even though I know Luke, now Luke is a physician, by the way, fully acquainted with Jewish culture. He doesn't tell us all the details. He just says, and Joseph and Mary did according to the law. You remember Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to what? To fulfill it. So every part of the law would be fulfilled with our Lord. He would do every part, even as a baby, his parents would be fulfilling the law. They would follow according to the laws, <laughs> what was directed, and they would do it. And so, this is why we see Jesus, uh, as my leader, I'm going to copy it. Was Jesus baptized as a baby? Is anyone familiar with any? There's no record of him being baptized. In fact, it won't be till 30 years later when he will go to the river. And who, by the way, will be the one that, that will baptize him? His cousin, John the Baptist, we just read about in the ch chapter before, will be the one that will baptize him. And when jo Jesus gets to John, John will say, no, I need you to baptize me. And Jesus says, don't know. It perm permit it. It fulfills all righteousness. I'm setting an example. Okay? I, John, just do it. Th listen. And John was going, no, you, you should baptize me. I should have, you, you know, you're the Lord. He goes, just, I'm trying to, you know, Jesus, I love how Jesus is. He shows everything to us by example. Now, when people ask, why don't you baptize the infants? I, I mean, being raised as a young Catholic, Italian, Roman Catholic boy, I was baptized. And some of you, anyone here uh, was also baptized as an infant? Yeah, we, this is very common in our culture, that people are baptized as infants, but it's not scriptural. Because in the book of Acts, it tells us that you must repent and be baptized. Repent. It, repentance is um, like part of the whole get ready for your baptism thing. And I have the dickens of a time getting those little ones to repent. <laughs> you know, as much as I try, repent your little torpin. <laughs> you know, I mean, they just, I can't get a yes or no. Did they really repent? <laughs> and what are they repenting for? I mean, there's a their fallen nature. I don't know. I mean, they're just so small. Just, it's, it doesn't, see, Jesus did everything so we would have the right example. That he was dedicated as a baby and, and presented to the Lord. Now, there's more to this. This custom of presenting the, 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 the firstborn male. Jesus did not only fulfill here Leviticus 12. He fulfilled the other portion of the law, what Moses wrote about in Exodus. In Exodus, guys, Moses wrote something to us that says that God had purchased every firstborn. That the firstborn that would open the womb would be called holy, consecrated unto God. And this is a really interesting passage to me that I get to throw in on the date because Jesus was the firstborn, of course, for Mary and Joseph. And some people don't know that Jesus wasn't the only child because I grew up thinking he was the only child. And I didn't read the gospel accounts where it said that, you know, he, his very brothers were there and his sisters and names the brothers. And, and I'm thinking, I was always jealous of Jesus because I, I came from a big family. You know, I thought, if you've been in a big family, you know you have to share. And you have hand-me-downs and, hand in my case, hand-me-ups. I was a twerp. My br little brother outgrew me, and I had to take his. You know how humbling it is to take your little brother's pants because he outgrew them? And you got to wear his. Oh, man. And I was thinking, Jesus never had this problem because he was the only child. Till I, till I actually read in the Gospel of Matthew and found out, is this not his brother's? And it lists them, and I'm like, and remember it says even his own brothers mocked him. They didn't believe in him. You know, when, when family can be cruel, can't they? You know, when it comes to our faith, they can really razz you sometimes about your faith. And even Jesus got it from his own. But they weren't his, I call them his half-brothers. Because technically, see, they were from Mary and Joseph, whereas Jesus was from the Holy Spirit and Mary. So same mom, different dad. And here we have, let me show you something in Exodus chapter 13 that God says that he gets all the firstborn. He paid for him, he said. 
Exodus chapter 13, verse 1 says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Sanctify to me every firstborn, the firstborn offspring of every womb amongst the sons of Israel, both man and beast, he says, belongs to me. Now, if you read on through the chapter, you'll find out that the Lord will d give direct instructions as to why this is. Well, what's so big deal? That why does God own the firstborn? Well, let me show you. Then it says, now the Lord said, when I bring you into the, uh, into the land of the Canaanite, verse 11. This is Exodus 13, 11. As, as, it says, as he swore to you and to your fathers to give it to you, that you shall devote to the Lord the first offspring of every womb, the offspring of, of every beast that you own, the males belong to the Lord. But every first offspring of a donkey, he says, you shall redeem it with a lamb. If you do not redeem it, then you shall break its neck. He says, and every firstborn amongst men, he says, of your, uh, amongst your sons, you shall redeem. And it shall be that when your son asks in the times to come, saying, what is this that, that you shall say to him with a powerful hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. And it came about when Pharaoh was stubborn about letting us go. This is why the firstborn, by the way, belonged to God. What did God do to get Pharaoh that straw that broke Pharaoh's back that made him finally say, all right, you guys can go? Do you guys remember this? That very last thing, he, 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 he had them slay a lamb. And he told all the Israelites to take a lamb and to slay it and to take its blood, put it on a hyssop branch, paint it over the doorpost and the lintel of the house, and go inside and roast the lamb and eat the entire lamb. This was their last meal in bondage in Egypt. I find it really interesting. The blood of the lamb will be the thing that will be the covering because it says then the angel of death was going to pass through Egypt, right? And everyone who was inside the house where the blood of the lamb was, what did the angel of death do? Passed over. That's where we get the name Passover. Death passed over. And so... All of the firstborn that night, though, the angel of death of, of every firstborn male in Egypt, every firstborn of the animals, they all died at once. That was the sign. God said, I'm, I'm Pharaoh. I'm not fooling with you anymore. He hit him right where it hurt. You know, this is this. I mean, that's his heir to his throne. Pharaoh takes out. God takes out Pharaoh's uh, uh, son and, and Pharaoh goes, all right, you guys can go get out. Get out. And he sends them on their way. And so the Lord declares that because I did this to Pharaoh and killed every firstborn in the land of Egypt, that both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beasts, that this is why we do this. You tell your kids this. This is why we do this. And therefore I sacrifice to the Lord the males, the firstborn of every womb, but the firstborn of my sons I redeem. There was, a, a, there was a, a, an edict given by God to Moses to redeem every firstborn male, every firstborn of the animal. And if you didn't, if you didn't redeem the, the firstborn of, say, uh, uh, of your, do you see that? The firstborn of your donkey, what do you have to do to it? Kill it. You say, well, that is cruel. Why would God do that? Because he's trying to make you remember what he did to set him free. And interestingly enough, you know, about 25 years ago, I heard a study done by, I, I think it was the Billy Graham uh, group. They did a study of just a census. They took, uh, they went through, they went through the United States, and they asked what position in your family were you born into, and they asked all the ministers of all the different denominations. I was really, I, I found this really. Let me see. Was this statistically significant? It was over ninety-six percent of the of the all. I mean, we're talking Baptist, Catholic, any any of the guys in ministry. They asked. What, what lineup, where in the lineup were you born in your family? That over 96% were firstborns. Hmm, I think, is that a coincidence, you think? Coincidink? No, God knew exactly, he said, I, read, I paid for them. Them firstborn are mine. They're set apart for me. Now, Jesus was the firstborn. And Luke tells us, according to the law, Mary and Joseph went up to the temple to present him to the Lord. Now, let me share with you the presentation. 
Because this is where we get to savor some of the really beautiful things that take. This, I may not get the first John today, but I'll get a really good study for you on the, on the presenting of the baby, okay? And this will be like the best one I ever, hopefully I ever did. Most thorough. Let me show you in Luke chapter 2 what happened when Jesus was brought. And, and this might be some inspiration for some of you listening because, see, on that day when Jesus was brought to the temple, now remember, he, he had the first week at home, eighth day circumcised, then he has his name given to him, and then he had 33 more days that they didn't go up for. Another month goes by. See, we don't see that because it's just this verse and then the next verse we think, oh, he got named and he was at the temple. No, wrong. Insert 33 days. Then he's at the temple. So he's, a, he's like 40 days old, 41 days. You know, they're getting cute then. They're getting a little baby cheek fat and, you know, they're bringing him to the temple to dedicate. Mom's had, a, a, a you know, a little about a month and a half to recuperate. And she's going to... By the way, do gals get emotional after this whole birthing thing? And, you know, this, the, the, the hormones got to readjust and the things go. And the Lord, the Lord knew all this. He figured, he put, I like the way he does it. He gets this all set up so that Mary and Joseph are going to go up to the temple now. And they're going to go to present their baby to the Lord. Uh, and, and, by the way, they have to bring, according to the law in Leviticus, a presentation of a sacrifice you know, a payment for the redemption. Just like when you, when, when you wanted to redeem the, the, um, the donkey, you had to give a lamb. When you want to redeem your child. Now, if you were poor, the Lord even accounted for the people who are poor. They, they could give a couple pair, uh, a pair of turtle doves. You know, some small offering. But they still had to do the whole offering. Why? It was symbolically saying, we're redeeming, we're paying for the firstborn. Like God has told us to do. There's a, there's a price to keep this. And Christ, by the way, is our price. He paid to redeem us. But here, he's going to fulfill the whole law when he does this. Now, when he gets there, I love this part. Look with me at, at Luke chapter 2. It says, Then <laughs> it came about, they went to offer, the, according to the, what the law said in verse 24, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now, you could offer actually more than this, uh, a lamb, you could offer more expensive animals, but it tells me that Mary and Joseph were not wealthy. By what Luke includes here, if I, if I was to read Leviticus chapter 5, you know, they don't opt for the expensive um, offerings. They go with the, 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 the poorest, the poor man's offering. So it just tells me Joseph and Mary were of humble means. But what a day this dedication is going to be for these parents. When they get there, verse 25 tells us, there was a man from Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. Anyone heard of this gentleman? It says, and Simeon was a righteous man, a devout man. He was looking for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit of God was upon this man. And it says it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. He, he was... God's Spirit just told him, you're not going to die until you see the, the Messiah, the Savior that will come. And so he came in this spirit to the temple. And also, it says, when the parents had brought in the child Jesus to carry out for him the custom of the law, then it says he took him to, into his arms and he blessed God. Like, I could just see this whole guy, can I hold the baby? And he takes the baby into his arms and he blesses God. And he says... Now, Lord, you're, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word. In other words, I have seen your salvation. You can, you can, what's he saying? You can take me now, Lord. What a good day. I have seen the Messiah. Now, can you imagine if you're Mary? You just, you know, your hormones have gone through a little bit of roller coaster. You had to, the, the, you know, because when a gal has a, a, a baby boy inside her, she's got all those testosterone hormones forming the baby and, and she's wired with estrogen and then the baby's birthed and then all of a sudden the body's got to revert and there's a whole roller coaster ride that goes on she's all going through that ride and just and then she gets this old guy a devout man just gonna hold your baby and and what's he say oh look at this child 
I could just see him doodling over, just, you know, just gaga. Oh. oh, Lord, look up to heaven. Lord, you can take me now. I've seen your salvation right here. He's holding the Savior, and he knows it. He knows it. Now, what if you're married? You had a hot, bad hormone week last week, and you think it's been a little rough, you know, and and then you hear this old guy, really devout man, crying out to God, thank you, God, go ahead, take me, I can die now. You've let my eyes see your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all people, a light of the revelation of the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. He starts declaring this. And your mom going, it was a rough week last week, but it's getting better. <laughs> wow. You know, it's nice for a mom to hear good things about their baby. They worked hard for that. They got the baby, and, 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 and there's this man declaring, this is the light to the Gentiles. This is the salvation promise to the Jews. This is it. Now, she could have been, you know, having a rough week. Maybe last month's been a little bit of a challenge. But this day, she gets greeted with this greeting. How would you like that? And then, oh, it doesn't stop. Listen to this. His father and his mother were amazed at the things which were being said by him. I'm sorry, about him. And Simeon blessed them. And he said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel, for a sign to be opposed, and a sword will pierce even your own soul, to the end that, that the thoughts of many hearts might be revealed. Now also there was a prophetess there, a woman named Anna, daughter of Phanuel, and she was from the tribe of Asher. And she was advanced in years. She had lived with her husband for seven years after marriage, and then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple. She served night and day with fasting and prayers. You got this devout widow in the temple. She's 84 years old, and what's she do next? Do you guys, have you read this part? I love this part. She goes, um, at that very moment, she came up and she began giving thanks to God, and she continued to speak of him to all those that were looking for redemption in Jerusalem. Everybody listen up. Anyone want to be redeemed from your sin? The Redeemer is right here. The Redeemer. Now, they're going there to give this little turtle dove offering, according to the law, to redeem their firstborn. But what are they hearing? You got something better than that. This is the Redeemer for everyone. This is the one, the Lamb of God. Now, 30, skip forward just a couple chapters and they'll grow up and you know of course we don't have much of Jesus's life in between we have him visit the temple at you know 12 he goes with his family up to Jerusalem again you, you guys know that that's all we get from the baby story until his adulthood we get one little glimpse in between Does anyone ever wonder why they threw that in I have an insight might help you you know what See, this comes from my Catholic upbringing. We got baptized as babies. But to be really honest, the baptism, if you study the, 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 the whole thing, it's more, like a devo it, it's more like a presentation of the baby. The spirit of it is similar to what these guys did. They've, they bring your baby to present him to the Lord. But does that mean the baby is saved because you presented him? No, it's the faith of the parents, it says, that, that is a covering to that child. Until they come in Jewish culture to the age of... Uh, well, we, 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 we say that they come to an age of understanding where they're old enough to understand. And they have in the Jewish culture a thing called a bar mitzvah to announce the changing of that child from baby mind to adult enough to understand for themselves. In other words, they're able to stand up and confess their own faith to come as a young adult and say, now I believe because of me, not because of, you know, my parents counting it for me. So, so in, in, by the way, in my Catholic upbringing, it was very similar. We had, you got dedicated, er, you got um, baptized as a baby, but that your, your parents' faith is what covered you until we had this other thing when we got to a certain age. Very s you wonder where they, these things, how, how similar they are? We had this thing called confirmation. Anyone know what confirmation? Where we had to confirm that we had the faith, that we were 
that was, you know, modeled to us by our parents and that we now follow because it's our choice. Funny, it wasn't really presented much as a choice to me, though. <laughs> it's more like, you will do confirmation. You know, instead of, I mean, the, the spirit of the thing was supposed to be, we were supposed to choose, okay? But interestingly enough, even though Jewish culture has the same thing, when Jesus gets to, you, you know, we don't know. It does not say that he was there for his bar mitzvah, but I suspect being 12, and the only thing given to us that they went, his parents went up to Jerusalem again, and they go up there for the feast, and what happened? They departed to go home afterwards, right? doesn't tell us they could have gone for his bar mitzvah. I suspect they did. This is why. Because on the way back, it says they travel a couple days' journey, and they suppose that he was with, you know, some of the relatives or some, some, uh, someone in the gang, right? And what happened? They couldn't find him anywhere. Wasn't with them, so they had to go back. And when they got back, where'd they find Jesus in Jerusalem? He's in the temple. And what was he doing? He was teaching. He was discussing with the rabbis. If God is God, and you know, and he was actually, this would be, by the way, an act of adulthood. You don't have the child teach the rabbi in Jewish culture. That's why I think it, it's possible that was his, he was bar mitzvah, what the Jewish would accept as you're now of age of understanding for yourself. And then what's the first thing he does? <laughs> Goes in the t and Mary's like, what are you doing, son? You really freaked us out. I, I'm paraphrasing, of course. And he's like, Mom, don't you know I have to be in my father's house? Did he know who his father was? Yeah. That's the only thing from, we, we get this account of baby dedication, skip forward 12 years, back at dad's house, and this time he's teaching. And then we skip forward to 30 years old when he enters his public ministry and says, John, baptize me. I have to do some things to fulfill all righteousness. I'm setting the example. And so when people ask me, why don't you baptize them little guys? I said, I prefer to present them to the Lord the way that Jesus was presented. I'm going to follow Jesus. He's my example. And when they get to the age of understanding, then they can choose for their own faith. But for the time being, Patrick and Felicia's faith is going to be the covering for Patricia. I like their name, the little girl's name. They just took their name, Patrick, Felicia, Pat, Felicia, Patricia. <laughs> Put them together. And, uh, and we get the little one we get to dedicate today. And this, this is the presentation. Now, on this day when Jesus was presented, God brought some older folks around to speak some very comforting words. And by the way, I didn't read it to you, but Mary, it says, treasured up all these things in her what? In her heart. Just like she treasured up when the shepherds had showed up and said, oh, this angel appeared and said, you know, glory to God in the highest and peace with Men on earth with whom he is well pleased. And the angel said, there's a baby born and he's lying in the manger. You'll, you'll see him and we come to, and yep, there he is. And when the shepherds revealed how God had sent an angel to them to say the Messiah was born, Mary treasured up those things in her heart. But I liked that the Lord, that was, that was at the birth. When is this? Do the math. Seven days, then the eighth day circumcised, plus 33 days. So we're like 41 days from now? 40, so just to make sure Mary doesn't, she's just a little positive reinforcement. Your moms need a little encouragement, don't they? They should get it constantly, according to what I think, but this culture doesn't really do it like the, bu like the Bible teaches. But the Lord was covering Mary. And by the way, I think pre days of presentation are some of the best days for the parents. Because God can send and Anna, a prophetess, or Simeon, and they can come and they can speak these words that tell the parents, your child has a special calling from God. And it, it, does, do parents, does that, is that something we need to know as parents raising these kids in, these generation, in this generation? Sure. It's nice to know that God is with us, that he sees that child. And that prophet looked at that baby and said, Take me, Lord. 
You can take me home. I have seen your what? Your Savior. Now, Christ hadn't saved yet, but he, you know, the neat thing about the eyes of the Spirit is you can see things in a child that is he, it, it will take three decades to find out what Simeon already knew. I mean, I'm talking like public declaration of what Simeon declared in the temple that day. And that's why the way, why we dedicate or present babies to the Lord. And as we do, I like to do was modeled to me by an older pastor that we pray a blessing over the parents that we and, and that we allow God's spirit in case he should give one of you guys a word of prophecy or encouragement for the parents they'd be glad to hear anything you got to tell them you know tell them what the Lord gave you and and, and let them be built up because those are the things they get to treasure in their heart that will carry them through the whole child rearing years you know I mean, maybe someone had to remind Mary when she was stressing out as they're running back to Jerusalem. Going, where'd he go? Panic, man. Where have you been, son? Well, Mom, I can just see it, a 12-year-old. Mom, don't you know? I'm supposed to be in my father's house. Now, what if one of the folks that was at the dedication said, don't you remember the old guy? But he said, don't you remember what Anna said? The, she was prophesying to everyone who would listen. Listen, everybody. Here's the light to the Gentiles. Here's the Savior to the Jews. This is salvation. S Savior, light, he's here, back. Don't worry. The light, the Savior, you don't really have to stress out. It's all good. But sometimes these things we need to take and treasure them. You know, when you really hear a, a word that's for you, isn't it nice when God speaks something to you? Anyone had God just give you that little nugget when you needed it? You're like, there's just that little something that only you know. Maybe no one else knew. But you can treasure it in your heart. Today I pray for this couple that God will give them what they need. On this day, those little spiritual nuggets that you hold on to, those treasures of things that God has. And only he knows. He knew the future, what was lying ahead for his son. He knew all of it. But he chose by his spirit to reveal it to Simeon. And he chose by his spirit to reveal it to Anna. And I believe he chooses by his spirit to reveal things to us. Some of you, you're spiritually the, the Simeons and the Annas uh, in the body of Christ. And God wants to use you. I do not believe that when you get older, you get retired from God's work. Like, you know, I'm too old, God could never use me. Is that true? I mean, here's this dude ready to death's door. He's like, okay, Lord, now you can take me. You know, he was hanging in there till the end. Uh, Lord said, you're not going until you see the Messiah. <laughs> okay, I'm waiting. I like that he, as soon as he holds the baby, it's like, all right, take me. I'm done, you know. I wonder how long he lived. Does not say. That's one of my, that's an easy question. You get to heaven. Like, so, Simeon, you're Simeon? Yeah. How long did you stick around after Jesus? Was that, just, don't I think weird? I, I think of these things. It, it's, not in the, it's not in the scripture. But I know God said he wasn't going to die until he saw it. And that gave him the hope and the strength to carry on his life until this day where they would intersect. God brought this couple on this special day that we get to share with them. I'd like the elders to come up with me. Would you two come up here? Patrick and Felicia, come up here. We're going to gather around them and pray and lay hands on them. And this one, I, I, I want you to film this kid up close. And uh, don't worry about the young man film. I want him to get this for later. We're going to put this on the YouTube. For Look at this one. Is that not cute as can be? Now, if you don't mind, um, I I if you're comfortable with this, would you raise your hand, extend your hand? In Hawaiian, they, they do this to raise for a blessing on the... And we're going to pray a blessing on this couple and on this little one. Okay. Don't cry on me, okay? It's okay. <laughs> Lord, I thank you so much for the privilege we have. No, no, I said don't cry. She didn't hear don't. You didn't hear don't. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> it's okay. Hi. Father, thank you for this beautiful child and this wonderful... Father and mother that would come before you. 
We ask that you would just hear our prayer, Lord, as they come to present her to you, to Patricia, to bring her before your throne of grace. We ask that you would give to her from this day forward a measure of your spirit to watch over her, protect her, Lord, to give her parents wisdom in raising her, that she would be raised in the knowledge of you, and that she would come to follow you and be used for you. And we ask that in Jesus' name. And everyone that agree with me said, Amen. 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 Look at that cutie. I tried to hold her, but I tried earlier and she just cried. <laughs> it was like, I love babies, but this one is, this one is only happy when I get like this close. Hi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> oh, there you go. I almost got a smile. <laughs> then she looked at your mug and said, no thanks, man. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> oh, look at it. Oh, yeah, you're going to pull it off now, and I'm going to be embarrassed. <laughs> well, I'm so glad. May the Lord just watch over you. Oh, now you're smiling. You like this, huh? Ooh, ooh. <laughs> ooh. This is the best part of my job. I mean, come on. How can you not? I don't know. I'm just wired for this. You want to come say hi? Just a little quickie. Look at Mom's right there. <laughs> hi. Give you back before you cry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's crying out, Mom. Well, bless you guys. May the Lord give you all your all the wisdom you're gonna need. And uh, there's days when we need extra wisdom from above, right, parents? Anyone give an amen to that? Amen. You know what? I was gonna do the whole part about First John. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the what? The children of God. Next week. We'll do that. So if you would read ahead to 1 John chapter 3, we'll look at that. And um, Maynard and Sharon will be gone. I'll miss them back to the mainland. But you can watch on YouTube. And Dylan's been very diligent to, to go home right away after service now and start working on editing and posting it. And guys, I have a great praise report. Uh, a pastor that I, he, he came to be the, the assistant pastor of the church I got saved in in Calvary Chapel in the northern Arizona, in, in Calvary Chapel, Cottonwood, Verde Valley, he would um, become Mick Meyer's assistant pastor. And Mick was one of the elders back then. He wasn't the pastor, but he wound up being the pastor later. And this man, John Bonner, wound up being his assistant. And he's listening to our sermons. He's serving the Lord in the mission field in, uh, in, in South America. And he's, he says, well, you have a real gift of teaching, and it really... And he's starting to quote all the bullet points of my sermons. In, 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 in his posts on Facebook, and I'm thinking, I just preached on that. And then I see it says at the bottom, like Pastor Izzy said, and, and I'm like, oh, he is. And he, he's writing me personal notes, thanks, and, and it's really encouraging me to hear you teach the word. So, so even from Hawaii, we have a, a, a chance to reach out and touch people. Mary listens in Thailand. Hi, Mary. Yep. And all of the Cricks School. And, uh, and we want all those guys to be encouraged, too, that we pray for them. We, this is a house of prayer, right? for all nations let's close in prayer father we pray as we go through the rest of this week this upcoming week lord we ask your spirit to lead us to guide us lord to pour out those things into our lives that we need we pray for our missionaries we pray for mary over in thailand ron miller we ask you lord for for john bonner for michael ullman over uh in the philippines lord guard and protect his family as they relocate guard his his assistant pastor who's taken over now the uh, the helm of Calvary Chapel Golden Grace. We ask that you just give him everything he needs and protect those guys as they're killing Christians in that in that island. We just ask put angels to guard them and protect our brethren. Guide us now from this place this day by the leading of your spirit. Build us up in our faith, Lord. As we go from here, we ask it in Jesus name. And everyone that agree with me said, Amen. Amen. Go in the grace of the Lord. May his peace Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo, and God bless.